Okay, so today I have for you the Celtic creation story. And this Celtic creation story comes from a reconstruction by Sir John Rees. And he wrote a series of lectures in 1886 called the Hibbert Lectures. And they were published in a book in 1888 and I'll post a link to that book down below and that book is freely available so you can just download that in PDF format straight from the internet. Now the book draws on both Irish and Welsh Celtic sources of literature in an endeavour to unravel the Celtic story. But he doesn't just use the sources of the Welsh and Irish literature. He also uses archaeology or finds in archaeology, the iconography. And also he draws from other cultures that are related to the Celtic cultures other cultures that are derived from the Proto-Indo-European culture. And so this book is a, an absolutely fascinating read for anybody interested in getting to the truth of the Celtic story. But we should remember that this book is now over a hundred years old. And so, not everything is going to be accurate by today's standards. But that shouldn't detract you from seeing the nuggets of gold that he's managed to collect from the wealth of information that he's been through and he's researched. And so, I don't think there's anybody that's come anywhere near close to what Sir John Rees accomplished back in his day. Today there are scholars in history and archaeology and there are scholars in mythology and literature but I don't think there's anybody really that's gone and done so much work as Sir John Rees has done to combine the two together to get at the real Celtic story. And so this book is well worth the read for that purpose. Now at the conclusion of the book, he has written a reconstructed Celtic creation story. And he's drawn on his knowledge of the Welsh and Irish literature along with related cultures and their creation stories. And he's put together a story that he considers to be a feasible version of that story. But it's not just his reconstruction or reconstructed story I want to present to you today. I want to do that, but then I want to go a step further and I want to look at what he said and I want to compare it against what we know today. And I think you'll find that at the end of this we can draw some conclusions, some conclusions that really seem to have been missing from the story up until this point. And we can draw them with a high degree of certainty. So we'll do that at the end. So I think the way we should proceed with this is that I'll give you the story as laid out by John Rees and then at the end we'll break it down 
and we'll simplify it and we'll go through what we can draw out of this with some degree of certainty and I promise you that's going to be a bit of an eye-opener or at least I think it is so to do this I hope you can bear with me and forgive me for this but I'm going to have to be reading from my tablet and consulting my notes as we go so let's get on with it the story as laid out by Sir John Rees so in the beginning earth and heaven were great world giants and they were the parents of numerous offspring but the heaven in those days lay upon the earth and their children crowded between them were unhappy and without light so earth took counsel together with her children against heaven and one of her sons who was bolder than the others undertook shamefully to mutilate heaven out of his skull they made the firmament and the spilling of the blood of his body caused a great flood which as it settled in the hollows of the earth made up the seas some of the children of the earth were born bright beings or gods who mostly loved the light and the upper air and some were giants or titans who were of a darker or gloomier hue these latter hated the gods and the gods hated them the daring son of earth who began the mutilation of the world giant was one of the titans and he became their king but the gods didn't want a titan to rule over them and their abode so he was driven from his throne by his youngest son who was a god so it may probably help if I was to tell you who they were talking about at this point so the titan that slayed heaven was belly or in the Irish bile and his youngest son according to John Rees was Nuada in the Irish Nuth in the Welsh and so we'll continue the king belly beaten in battle sailed away to other parts of his realm after and after much wandering on the sea he was at last received in the country of the happy departed whence he was afterwards thought to bless the farmer's toil and to help man in other ways and this comes from the Irish literature and if you want to check that out that would be the story that is about Don and Bile and the Malaysians when the great flood caused by the mangling of the world joint took place all the men were drowned but two and those two were saved in a ship he who made and owned the ship was not a man nor did the gods own him as one of them but he was a giant or a titan who was kindly disposed towards the race 
and when he had finally safely landed them where they were to dwell, he went away to the same place as the dethroned king, for he was kith and kin of the dethroned king. Unless, perhaps, those are to be followed who thought that the two were one and the same, and that's important. And that person, no other than the ruler of the departed himself, the God of all beginning and all end. So again, we're talking about the Baal Don story from the Irish literature. So the story of Baal and Don can be read in an Irish source called, let me just say a minute, it's called the Lebo Gabala Erin. And basically, Baal is the king of the Malaysians, an invading force from Spain. And Baal and Don eventually both die in a shipwreck. And Don is Baal's son, and Don becomes known as God of the Underworld. And what Sir John Rees is saying there, what he speaks about the two being of kith and kin, he's talking about Don coming back as God of the Underworld to help the people survive the flood. But then he goes on to say, for some that believe they were one and the same, so Baal, the father and the son. So Don being the reincarnation, the rebirth of Baal. Or in our case, it's referring to belly. In, as the Celts always do, they have this cyclical fashion of life, death, rebirth, and this is typical of that. And so it's saying that Don is the rebirth of Belly and Lord of the Underworld, and he was the one that provided the ship. So continuing the story, and we're still talking about the Bile and Don relationship here and he says the viewed through the medium of the latter and he means the god of all beginning and the god of all ends and so viewed through the medium of the god of all end he appeared to be the demon of darkness and horror and death but through the former, he seemed to be the first father and great parent of all. And that we know about Belly. That's one of the things we do know about Belly, is that he was seen to be the father of all. And so he goes on to say, and so it was a matter of piety to reckon darkness before light, the night before day, and the winter before summer. So there, of course, he's just referring to the fact of how the Celts saw every day beginning at night and every year beginning in the winter. Now he goes on to talk about the new king of the gods. So, Belly's gone, he's down into the underworld, and the gods have a new king. 
And as I said before, John Rees considers this new king to be new. So the new king of the gods was of a passing brilliant nature. So they called him Bright and Day and Father Sky. He was a mighty warrior, but he had terrible foes who forced him to take part in many a fearful struggle. When he fought in summer, he always triumphed, but he fared ill in winter conflicts. Now this is one part where I have a few problems. Because as I said before, he sees Nuth in this role as being the new king of the gods who has sent belly to the underworld and so he's saying basically that Nuth or Nuwada is the Zeus of the Celtic world and I'm having some real problems with that but we'll come back to that a bit later in the summary so he says here now he's talking Nuth on one occasion he was badly wounded and would never have recovered his former strength and form but for the timely aid of a man who was a cunning leech and on another occasion he and another sorry he and the other gods would have been hard beset had they not taken care to secure the help of the sun hero now john rees sees lou as being the sun hero and he's immortal according to john rees and he says the last was not a god but a youthful son of a mortal there was however no spearman anywhere to equal him and his father was so wise and crafty that he had forced the gods to treat mankind far better than they had been treated before for the good things bestowed on man were often begrudged by the gods and most of all by the owners of wealth of the netherworld and the land of the happy dead so then it goes on to say that the gods they hated this mortal so kind that he was to his race and they made him suffer untold pain and torture but he he always succeeded in the end and he cheated them of the dog that was to be the hunter's friend and the servant so saying that Lou give the dog to the humans to help them with their hunting and also how he created the strong drink that was to cheer man and to give them dreams of poets and the visions of prophets these and the other boons too many to name one by one made him very famous and beloved more so in some lands than even the king of the gods himself and that is where john reese's story ends so now let's go back over this story and see what we can learn and i've been joined by the two cats here tom tom and miley he's down below he's the chatty one so
let's hope I hope they're not too much for disturbance so the story starts with heaven and earth already in existence and the earth is the earth mother which would be in our case Don or the Welsh Don not to be confused with the Irish Don the god of the underworld so again as with the other creation stories we see two races of gods a race of giants and a race of gods one of the race of giants as we saw in the other creation stories kills his father and creates the cosmos from his body and this god was belly the father of all the god of the underworld the god of darkness and death and the god of light and life now it says the gods didn't want a giant to rule their abode and so the younger son of the titan or the god of the giant belly knew overthrew his father in battle and belly went to reside in the underworld and it says belly sailed away to reside in other parts of his realm and settled in the land of the dead whence he was afterwards thought to bless the farmer's toil and to help man in other ways and this is also what we see belly as lord of the flocks he was the god of the farmers and he was the god of the herdsmen and this is still represented in the festival of Beltane today where the cattle are herded through the burning fires of Bel to purify them of disease then it talks about the great flood and it says that during the great flood all men were drowned apart from two who were given passage in a ship and the ship was provided by a titan well he says a titan let's say a giant who after making sure the two were safe returned back to the land of the dead and the new king was the son of belly the younger son of belly who was born a god knew and so now according to sir john reese the new king of the gods was knew the son of belly and he says that knew was in constant battle and he triumphed in summer and struggled in winter now I have a few problems with that so news we know was venerated historically as Norden's and he has a shrine at Lydney Park which is on the Severn River and that shrine shows every indication that he was more of a Poseidon Neptune type of god and it also talks about news being in constant battle when he won during the summer and he lost during the winter well the only places i know of where there are such battles in mythology are in the mabinogi and in the mabinogi 
we have Aaron who fights Hafgan and Hafgan is the god of the summer and the other story we have is where Gwyn ap Nuth is in constant battle or he has to battle every 1st of May with Gwaitha and Gwaitha then is translated to be son of Scorcher so again Gwaitha represents the summer and Gwyn ap Nuth is of course Gwyn son of Nuth so it wasn't Nuth so I do have some problems with John Rees fitting Nuth into this role but we'll get to that in a bit a bit later and then he says to help him in his battles against the winter he secures the help of the sun hero Lu so although there's a few things there that don't really add up we still owe a great debt of gratitude to John Rhys for his work in bringing this information together and comparing against other cultures to give us this story now although there are problems with news being the king of the gods this story does put quite a lot of things into perspective or explains a lot of things and one of them is the fact that we see giants mentioned right throughout the mythology the Formarians were giants in the Irish literature Bran was a giant in the Welsh literature then we have the whole Belly Lou case uh, who worshipped Belly and who worshipped Lou this was always a, a bit of a confusing muddle and then we've got the children of Don and the children of Lou the children of Don being the children of the light and the children of Lou being the children of the dark and there is really no explanation to this so but this story that John Rhys has given us does give us some ideas does give us some answers to these questions now we know where the giants fit in the giants being the first race of gods and this is the same in the Greek creation story it's the same in the Norse creation story and it's the same in many other stories two races of gods and the first being giants so now we know why the mythology talks about giants and the question in regards to the the children of the light and the children of the dark well that's also explained by this story and the titans uh, with the, or the race of giants with the children of the darkness the, the children of the underworld and the children of dawn well they were the children of the light and basically they were the children of the sky and the heavens but more importantly than that is that this relationship between the gods belly and Lu is explained now I think if we discount this bit about news 
and understand that there are some missing pieces to fit in in that particular part of the story. What we can take away from the story with, I think, a high degree of certainty is that there were two races of gods. A race of giants and a race of gods of the heavens. So at some time, way back in the past, before all these cultures split from the Indo-European group of peoples, and this would go back, perhaps, right back to the beginnings, to the Mesolithic, Paleolithic even. There was a belief in an Earth Mother and a God of life, death, darkness and light. And at some point, at a later date, beliefs changed such that they started to believe in the God of the heavens. And so the gods of the light and the gods they saw in the stars and the constellations. And all of this was before the culture split. So before the Greeks became the Greeks and the, the Celts became the Celts and before the Germanic tribes came into existence. This goes way back. And this, I see, is when Lu took his place as the second generation of gods. But that doesn't mean all people stop believing in the old gods. For instance, we have belly. We, we, we have records of belly being venerated right into Roman times. And I've no doubt that there were many who had both the gods, the old gods of the darkness and the gods of the light as part of their pantheon. And this is what we're being told in the Mabinogi. Well, we do have the children of the dark and we do have the children of the light and there are battles between the two. And so we have it. A story that tells us of two generations of gods. The generation ruled by Beli and Kununos and the generation of gods ruled by Lu. And they were both active at the same times. And so just being able to understand that relationship between the gods of mythology and the historical gods and the relationship between the older gods and the newer gods, I consider that to be well worth the effort of this exercise and a major step forward in understanding the Celtic pantheon and gives us a far better insight into the mind and belief systems of the Celtic people. Well I hope you consider this exercise as being worthwhile and this will be the last of the creation stories for the moment. I do find these 
creation stories absolutely fascinating and so I will be doing more I did promise that I would do one of the Babylonian creation story and I will be doing that but I'll take a bit of a break from the creation stories for now but I will be back with you next week and with that I'll ask you if you've enjoyed what you see here then consider subscribing any questions drop them in the comments below and with that I'll see you next week